Hello again, everyone. My name is Joe Callingham. I also gave you the lecture on the introduction to interferometry. Now I'm going to come back to polarization. It feels like I'm kind of booking, bookending the, uh, the course here. Um, so I'll introduce what we can do with polarization. Why is polarization interesting and why is it hard? I've called it AKA the hard stuff. I'm, I'm usually not a fan of making things out to be more difficult than they are, but Polarization is tricky and it takes a bit of time, but the reward you get at the end is, is usually well worth the effort. Um, you just need to do some extra calibration steps. This is quite often why a lot of astronomers don't end up bothering. And also because a lot of the radio sources aren't, aren't polarized, but we'll touch on that through this talk um, and this lecture. So I just want to thank uh, Dave McConnell and Bob Salt in particular, because I've recycled some of the material for this lecture. So why is polarization so interesting? Well, radio in particular is key in measuring polarization, uh, better than any other wavelength, uh, essentially. And it's one, because of the way we can store phase and, and understand how phase works. But in particular, polarization is a great trace of magnetic fields. And we'll come to explain why exactly. If this is, um, And what's interesting about magnetic fields is they kind of span everything in the universe, you know, and they play a fundamental role. You might've even heard the joke of like people asking, or oh, have you thought about magnetic fields? They're difficult to understand, but as we know from radio astronomy, you know, we only have emission largely from AGN and all this kind of stuff is because electrons are spiraling in magnetic fields. So there's some traces here and polarization really gives a lot of constraints on these traces, particularly if you understand their emission mechanism. So for some example of the magnetic field strength in the universe, you've got, um, high redshift seed field. So these are like the earliest day uh, in the earliest seconds of the universe or even milliseconds or microseconds of the universe that you um, have some deviations in the, in the cosmic microwave background, you can get very small seed fields. Then a balloon and these structures such as uh, but in filaments between galaxies all have their own magnetic fields and they play an important role for accretion and maintaining how uh, plasma moves. The other ones are more closer to home. You've got stars, um, which I'll touch on more on the uh, next slide. And the other ones, you can go all the way to the other scale. We're talking about pulsars. These are the remnants of mass massive stars that are only about a few kilometers across, but incredibly dense. These have huge magnetic fields, 10 to the 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 gauss. Um, you've got magnetars and then potentially more esoteric stuff, but stuff we definitely know and definitely trace. We've got We've got magnetars at the top end with like 10 to the 15 gauss to say into into uh, cluster mediums of about a micro gauss. So we span over 10 to the 20 orders of magnitude, which is kind of amazing. And polarization is a fantastic tracer of all of this. Close to my home and what I study is particularly stellar systems of the radio and magnetic fields are, are, are really important here because we wouldn't get radio emission from them. For example, Jupiter and IO interaction where uh, they kind of form an electrodynamic engine because IOs uh, magnetic field sweeps over Jupiter produces the radio aurora that you can kind of see uh, in the artist's impression over here on the left. You also get really big flare stars can emit in the radio and the magnetic field is important for reconnection and causing the plasma to spill out and get the radio emission from there. So end of the day, polarization is a fantastic uh, tracer of the magnetic field properties of a lot of objects in the radio sky. So let's just make sure we're all on the same page and we'll start with what is polarization. Remember polarization just means light has a preferential direction. The electric field vector or the magnetic field vector, whichever one we want to parameterize has a preferential direction of, um, of, of, of oscillation. And so I'm just giving you two examples here. And um, this is just light obviously in a wave and we're using wave-like properties of light to talk about polarization. And what you can see here is X mode polarization. So you can see it's if I had a, a 3D uh, plane X, Y, Z, it's all, all the oscillations occurring in the X direction. Okay, so it's propagating along X and it's oscillating. Um, uh, I mean, it's propagating along Y and oscillating in X. Remember you from your probably physics and optics that you know that uh, the oscillation of, of, of the wave is, is uh, orthogonal, uh, perpendicular to, to the direction. And the same thing in the, um, on the right here, I'm just giving the exact same example, but rotated 90 degrees for Y. So this is what's called linear polarization. Why is it linear? Well, it's because it's uh, it's only in one direction um, and it's not, it's not shifting between X and Y continually. That's why it's called uh, linear. Um, and obviously you can have any angle in between, right? Uh, it doesn't matter. And you can decompose this as much as you like. And this is just the equations we saw in our first lecture as well. This is a wave, uh, wave equation and you just got X and Y added and this is just some angle uh, site and you can rotate it 45 degrees and, and it's still going to be linear right you're not shifting between x and y x and y is static and you're just doing the addition of the two so you can have 45 degree angles one degree angles 10 degree angles it doesn't matter at all so that's just one form of polarization called linear polarization it just means it has a preferential oscillation 
And the other one, obviously, is circular polarization. So you can have a continually, as the star uh, propagates, it continually rotate between X and Y. And so that's a, a really uh, unique uh, polarization called circular polarization. And you can have different handedness of this. So you remember maybe from high school, right-handed rule and left-handed rule, it depends which way the way is rotating, but you can change the direction. It, it preferentially shifts between X and Y. And that's uh, this is where these vectors come in here, this X and Y vector. So you can have it left-hand circularly polarized or you can have it right-hand circularly polarized. And so that's, that's um, more or less all of it, right? Um, and what's amazing with polarization, and you probably learned this in optics as well, is that you can decompose, no matter if it's just linearly polarized, no matter if it's circularly polarized, you can decompose it all in, two, in terms of two orthogonal bases. So you can kind of see this in this gift here that um, what I've got is, imagine I've just got, I'm sampling the wave at a particular point, and uh, this is just, say, a Y, um, let's call it a feed, an X uh, feed, there's a horizontal and a vertical feed. And that means when the incident light, now even if it's circularly polarized or anything, I'm just, I can just sample all that information in that plane and I just record the angle and that will rotate and it can shift all that kind of stuff. But as long as I just have two orthogonal uh, feeds, I can uh, intercept and record all that polarization features. So how do you describe uh, polarization? I kind of already mentioned this briefly. Um, one, you can have a uh, polarized light um, and you can, oh no, am I not recording? Oh, no, nope, I'm definitely recording. Um, so uh, there's just different ways of uh, describing polarization. One is total power, so the amplitude. Um, uh, the other way is talking about fractional powers between the horizontal and vertical linear components and then the phase relationship between all of those. So it's very similar to before. Um, before I go further, and I really should mention this is a reasonably short lecture. This is just to introduce some of the concepts. And what I would do if we were in person, we'd go through a tutorial together and make sure these uh, are a little bit clearer. But again, I can be on Slack and all that kind of stuff to answer these questions. But anyway, so how do we parameterize in radio astronomy uh, polarization? So we've talked about the electric field vectors of, of these waves, but uh, that's not generally the way radio astronomers tend to think about. We've used what's called the Stokes um, parameters. Um, uh, so what are, what are these Stokes parameters? Well, they're a lot easier to use over direct measurements of the electric field vectors. And it's because they're not a vector quantity. They just deal with the power of the electric field amplitudes. Um, and one of the reasons you do this is because the correlator, the back end, uh, can produce all Stokes parameters simultaneously. And that's not so easy in optical astronomy. You can't tend to do that. Um, and the exact definition of the Stokes parameters does depend on the feed, which gets a little bit complicated, but this is just a way of just um, describing linear and um, circular polarization that's easy with the instruments you have. So what are the Stokes parameters? You have what's called Stokes I. And you can see here, it's just E squared plus EY squared. So these are just the amplitude of the vector squared. So it's just a measure of what's called total intensity. It's just how bright is that source? And then what you have, what we call more the polarization uh, components of the Stokes parameters. You have what's called Stokes Q, Stokes U. Um, they're just linear components. Uh, uh, they break down how, um, how your wave is related to, how much linear polarization your wave has. And the final one is called Stokes V, and this is, uh, tells you about your circular polarization. And technically, Stokes I, if you just had the other Stokes parameters, um, they just uh, summed in quadrature. So I squared is equal to Q squared plus U squared plus V squared. So technically your linear polarization obviously can never exceed your total intensity, your linear and circular. So how do you measure this? Well, there's different types of feeds, just like there's different types of polarization. Uh, the two most common feeds, uh, you can use, you can get more complex here, but the two that most radio astronomers use are just called linear feeds. So what I'm showing you here a picture is imagine you're staring at where all the lights being intercepted at the telescope. And so these often in the receiver. Um, and so what you have here, just imagine these red things are just kind of like two bits of metal bars. You can also imagine that just hanging out. And uh, that is our, remember I told you, I talked to you about these uh, cross polarization, these orthogonal uh, feeds. These are the things in intercepting all the, all the light. And so you can see what you want things is, um, you have your EY, this is the, the vertical component in EX. And then from there, you can measure these Stokes parameters. So this is the linear feeds. More complicated things like the, the very large array use um, uh, circular feeds. Now these are also, just um, just as valid feeds, they they at least collect all the light, right? Because you've got the different orthogonal components. You have to have um, uh, x. Uh, you have to have one going in one direction and the other going in the other direction. But once you do all that, you can intercept all the light as well. And this is what I'm showing here on the right is a is a circular feed for intercepting this light. Now, how do you measure these Stokes parameters I just mentioned? Um, 
And conceptually, it's different. Um, I'm only going to focus on linear feeds because I think going into circular feeds is just overkill right now. But uh, at radio uh, frequencies, voltages can be measured and correlated. And so these are almost identical um, equations as I showed before, but now these X, X and Y, Ys represent the feeds I was saying before. So I is just the addition of all the flux that's on uh, the X, X parameter and the Y, Y parameter. And then some of these variants um, are a way to measure linear and circular polarization. Now you might notice particularly with U and V, you've got X, Y, not just X, X. And remember, because they got these um, two components to the feeds, right? You've got a top one and a bottom one. These are talking about the cross polarization terms. And so you can kind of begin to understand this is that um, with circular polarization, easy, by far the easiest, right? Obviously it's coming in, if you've got linear feeds, it's going to interact a little bit with the X parameter, a little bit with the Y parameter, a little bit Y and a little bit with the X. And so they're kind of called the uh, crosshand correlations while the XX and YY are called par parallel. So as I said, each uh, antenna measures two orthogonal polarizations, X and Y, and but also you get this information for every baseline and all the possible configurations, XX, YY, XY, YX. And then um, what you wanna do is you make sure you appropriately combine these four correlations to get your Stokes visibilities. And then from there, you just perform standard imaging to make um, your Stokes images, such as say a Stokes V image or a Stokes Q image or a Stokes U image. And then you can compare that to total intensity and talk about say, how circularly polarized something is or how linearly polarized something is. All right, so let's talk about some of the difficulties. So maybe I should just summarize here. So to keep in mind, light comes in from a radio source far away. That light can be preferentially linear or circularly polarized. You use a feed, you sit at your radio telescope, that feed has um, two orthogonal um, feeds. Uh, so an X and a Y, we're just going to do linear. And you can record all the information in this using your radio telescope. Sometimes light will interact a little bit with, um, with, the, uh, with, the X, uh, with the X and sometimes with a little Y or just Y or just X and sometimes the mixture of both. And you can decompose these into the Stokes parameters, which then you can use as a, ra uh, use a radio astronomer to make images and do science with. But there's a little bit more complexity here. Um, and this comes back to the Jones matrices. And if I was teaching this lecture in full, I mean, I'm teaching this course in full, I would definitely have made sure you've seen the Jones matrices by now. I really hope you have as well. Um, if you haven't, just ignore this slide, ignore what I'm about to say for the next 30 seconds. But if you have, you remember the Jones uh, uh, matrices have, have got a whole bunch of different components. One of them is the antenna gain. And so what this is just showing you is um, how your instrument responds in X and Y. And obviously if you have a perfect instrument, you don't have any extra response outside of X and Y. So remember the way to think about it is imagine your feeds are perfect, right? They're perfectly orthogonal to each other. But the reality in, in um, in uh, engineering and all this kind of stuff and in science that you can't make these things perfectly orthogonal. No matter how, how good you are, you're always gonna have a slight shift of angle between them. And this is what uh, it can produce what's called polarization leakage. And so what I'm showing you here in this matrix is obviously you've got the ones for the, the antenna game. And then you can see these off diagonal terms here. And these off diagonal terms are, are a way to parameterize the fact that maybe because you haven't got perfectly uh, perpendicular feeds, you can have a slightly small interaction with one over the other. And then you can parameterize this as in terms of some form of rotation. This is what the rotation matrix at the bottom is showing. So let's just talk about these uh, leakages. So leakage is probably far the most uh, problematic uh, issue with um, polarization because it means what it, you can think of it, right? You leak. So if you don't have a perfectly... Um, a perfect instrument, what happens is some of your, say, total intensity, how bright the source can leak into Q and U and V. So leak into your linear polarization or your circular polarization and give you a biased result. So you're not really measuring the true uh, polarization of the source. All you're doing is measuring imperfections in your instrument. Um, and these are from like essentially real world, uh, real world feeds. And this is very, very common. Um, and so one way to parameterize this is kind of just like I did before more and I did before in the matrix notation, this is just saying really, you're not just measuring EX, you're not just measuring the polarization in the X direction and the polarization in the Y direction with a feed, you're actually measuring also, you're getting a tiny bit of leakage from Y into X and a little bit of uh, leakage of, of X into Y. And so this, this leakage term is very usually very, very small and it's, it's all types of issues with alignment area, feed ellipticity, other issues like that. But you really need to parameterize this to understand it. Um, and so 
a lot of effort goes into observatories trying to understand this, this problem. It also means that really small leakage often can't be trusted unless you really understand your instrument well and you make sure you, you get this parameterization rate. So this is often where calibration comes in uh, important. You know what, it's kind of like your gain calibration, which you've learned by now, you know how bright a source is, so therefore you can scale your image amplitudes correctly. This is kind of similar in the fact that you can go and look at a polarized source and go, okay, I know from other work, from other people that I have to, detect 45% circularly polarized light from the source. If I don't, there's something wrong and you can parameterize some of your leakage components using that. But the problem with leakage, obviously it's X, Y, so it can actually shift across the sky depending where you're pointing. So you can kind of see how difficult polarization is gonna get, right? So if I have polarization, if I'm just looking directly up at the zenith, right? My feeds are gonna have a certain orientation on the sky, but if I go and look somewhere towards the horizon, now my feeds have a different orientation and the leakage is gonna be different there. So leakage can vary across the sky and this is where it's uh, somewhat difficult. So this is where what um, to make sure you can really understand your polarization and not only that your instrumental polarization the way your instrument responds to the sky and responds to polarization linkage is one of these things um, is what we use is what's called the parallactic angle. Um, I don't need you to take away too much information here. It's just to introduce you to the concept of it. It's just the angle uh, between the object um, and uh, that you're interested in, say, say a star or, or, or an exoplanet or a, or a galaxy and um, you're a zenith. So you imagine here on earth is our telescope. This is our zenith. So just directly above our head. And then this is where the source is. And the parallactic angle is just the angle between the celestial pole and that. So the celestial sphere. I know these angles can be just a little bit confusing and a little bit dull, but the point here I'm trying to make is that you need to sample this, what's called this parallactic angle to understand how your feeds respond on the sky. Um, Maybe this next uh, next slide will make more sense. So you have an old AS mount. So this is just the standard mount that a lot of radio telescopes have. This means the dish kind of moves and the mount stays still. There's other types of mounts, but I'm just going to fault on the old AS mount. The old um, for a conventional uh, old AS mount, you know that if you want to stare at the sky, right, you're going to slowly track it. But this also means the sky rotates relative to the antenna feed. Now that's what I was trying to show with this this instrument here, right? If I wanted to look at Rigel and I'm going to point my telescope at it, the sky is obviously rotating. And um, that means instru instru instrumental polarization, the leakage, you know, uh, what I've been talking about, how your instrument responds to polarization will be in the frame of the antenna. So your antenna is static on the sky, um, but the astronomical polarization will be in the frame of the sky. So if the source is polarized, it won't change with position on the sky, but your feeds will. And so that's one way of being able to decouple your leakage, your instrumental effects from your astronomical effects. You can see like, okay, I look at Zenith. This is what I measure for the polarization of the source. I look at the same source on the horizon and this is what I measure for the polarization of the source. It's different, So, but the source shouldn't have changed uh, for most sources say like AGN. So therefore, um, what I can do then is calibrate my uh, my instrumental leakage in this that, that that parallactic angle is the dictator of all this because that you're measuring in the frame of the antenna. Okay, so I know that's a little whirlwind, but hopefully, again, happy to ask any answer any questions about this stuff. So, what about uh, depolarization? So, this is the problem that uh, you just lose polar uh, polarimetric uh, signal. Um, this can happen because of your instrument and also can happen because of the way light travels through uh, our universe or our galaxy, for example. Um, let's think of an example. Uh, so uh, with, with uh, depolarization because of the sky, you have to remember a photon is emitted from a galaxy. It could be thousands of light years away, but that photon uh, or that, that ray of light as it enters, it actually interacts with stuff, say, along the line of sight. So it might hit some gas in the Milky Way. And what will happen then, maybe that uh, source far away was perfectly linear polarized, but when it hits uh, this, this dust or gas or stuff in the Milky Way, it can scramble that polarization. That's called depolarization. You know this affects somewhat... Um, from say uh, the reverse, say looking at um, the water um, on on Earth, you can what light can be polarized coming off that or off the side of cars or the effect in the sky. Um, you can get polarization because of the interaction with media along the line of sight. And but usually in radio astronomy, this leads to depolarization. It scrambles the signal. But you also can have. Um, uh, uh, problems with your instrument and uh, this can be all types of reasons uh, got to do with electronics or you can have a polarimetric response that's not being constant and that can smear out a signal as well. I'm not going to focus too much on that type of stuff but it's just to introduce you the concept that you have to be really careful with understanding your instrument with polarization to, to otherwise um, you can't get it back. <laughs> 
All right, so we've talked about polarization. What's just some of the concept we can draw out of it? Maybe before I introduce the concept, I just want to remind you that majority of radiation that we receive from extragalactic sources and most radio sources is, is synchrotron radiation. This is just radiation from electron uh, rotating in a magnetic field. And as it rotates in the magnetic field, you obviously have some force on it. And that force then causes acceleration, and which means, of course, that you can get the emission of light and uh, emission of a photon. And this is usually a non-thermal uh, effect. But why is that important? Because there's a few things with polarization that we can use to measure that really is just not available at other ones. And one's called the rotation measure. So I was kind of alluding this to you before that you can have a linear polarization of a source far away. And as it enters, it encounters junk along the line of sight, what happens is that polarization can be impacted. Sometimes that can be uh, that can cause depolarization, but also what it can do is cause what's called a Faraday rotation. And that linear polarization, when it goes through a magnetized medium that has its own magnetic field, so obviously polarization starts getting infected because the, the magnetic field will change the orientation, what you can do is get a rotation. And this is what I'm showing here on the right. So far away, um, this electric field here on the left, um, it enters some magnetized medium that causes a rotation, and that rotation then comes out at the end there. And what this rotation actually tells you is about the strength of the magnetic field along that line of sight and the how much materials along that line of sight. So that rotation measure is very, very useful. The other one is polarization vectors. These uh, can give you um, the strength of Q and U relative to other things. You can also take the gradients. You can do all types of cool stuff with measuring in a uh, stellar disturbance. And the last one, um, circular polarization for a synchrotron gives a direct measure of the magnetic field strength. And this is also true from say exoplanets and stars. The emission mechanism is in synchrotron there. It's more complicated. I won't bother going into details, but you can get the direct measurement of the magnetic field strength out from circular polarization. So just to conclude, I know this has probably been a, a somewhat short lecture and there's a lot of concepts here. But I know polarization can be intimidating, but I'm happy to answer any questions. And this is just a more advanced topic than Unit 4 usually covers. And so this is just to introduce you some concepts and then maybe you want to go further or your science interests make you think about this problem harder. But I just want to say there's a huge amount of information in polarization, uh, in polarized light and something uh, radio astronomy is uniquely suited to exploit. Um, but it is hard. Uh, instrumental, weak signals, depolarizations, many structures between us and the source all make these measurements very difficult to make and understand. And usually it takes a lot more calibration and that's why a lot of uh, astronomers don't tend to do it. But it's worth doing, you just have to make sure you understand your instrument and calibrators. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, this lecture. It's been reasonably brief and probably full of concepts, but again, happy to take any questions and I hope you're enjoying the course thus far.